done. And I can hide my Zoom. Perfect. Sweet. <clears throat> Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Rachel Hasna. I am with the University of New Mexico's Division for Community Behavioral Health. Uh, this is our Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, just a couple of quick announcements about our CEU process. In the last five minutes of the lecture, we will submit a evaluation link in the chat. If you use your mouse to um, toggle the menu at the bottom of the screen of your Zoom screen. You'll see an icon for chat. Click that. That'll bring up your chat box. Um, that's where you can retrieve the evaluation link. You'll click on the link, copy and paste it into your browser, fill it out. Uh, the evaluation uh, at the end of the evaluation, a certificate is automatically generated for you. It is your responsibility to save a copy. Um, uh, automatically generated, sorry. Um, you, if you're on your smartphone, you can take a screenshot of the document. If you're on your laptop or your computer, you'll wanna save a copy either as a, as a Word or a PDF, whatever works for you. If you're joining us by phone and uh, you need the link, you can just email me and I will email you the link for the certificate. We will be towards the um, end of the week, I will be sending out the recording link um, from the lecture, as well as copy a, a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, and I believe that's it. So I'll hand it over to Julie. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, welcome everybody to the University of New Mexico Lawn Mental Health Didactic Series. The series is hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. We're so glad to have you all here to join us today. My name is Julie Bravko. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. So first, I wanna remind you to join us next week. At that time, um, Dick Rogers is going to be presenting feigned mental disorders, empirically informed forensic practice. Next, for our talk today, um, please ask questions in the Q&A anytime you feel comfortable, but just know we're probably not gonna to get to them until the end. And also, we always try our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. Please forgive us uh, if we can't get to yours. Um, now, for those of you who want your CEUs but are on a tight schedule, you do have to stay for that full hour, but you don't have to stay longer than that. Um, I'll try to let you know when the hour is passed, but we will likely be staying on longer to address your questions. So now it's time for what we've all been waiting for. I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for today, uh, Caitlin McLaughlin. She is a clinical professor, or I'm sorry, a clinical psychologist and an assistant professor in the CPA accredited clinical psychology program at the University of Guelph in Ontario. Uh, an important aim of her program of research seeks to better understand and improve the experiences of individuals with fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorder in criminal justice and forensic contexts with a focus on identification and screening, understanding psycholegal abilities and risk and a critical policy translation focus to support better outcomes for vulnerable populations. Dr. McLaughlin, on behalf of the University of New Mexico, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and New Mexico's Behavioral Health Services Division, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for presenting today. We're so grateful for your time and expertise and I'm now gonna turn it over to you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Julie, for the warm introduction and welcome. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And um, I'm really appreciative of the invitation to join this fabulous um, seminar group and, and have an opportunity to share with you about a topic that I'm really passionate about. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that as I join you today here from the University of Guelph, um, I'm on the ancestral and treaty lands of several Indigenous peoples, including the Atawanran and the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, and would like to recognize and honor 
um, our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors. Um, we're within the lands protected by the one uh, dish with one spoon uh, wampum agreement, an agreement amongst all allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. And personally, I would particularly like to acknowledge thanks for the teachings that I've received from mentors and elders um, in my personal learning journey and um, from my research mentors and collaborators without whom this important work um, that I'm going to share with you today wouldn't be possible. So thank you for joining me. Um, as Julie mentioned, I am an assistant professor in the University of Guelph. It is pronounced as though there was a W in the title. And we're located, for those of you less familiar with Canada, Canadian geography in Ontario, um, about 100 kilometers or 62 miles, depending on your measurement system, uh, from Toronto. And I've included a few pictures for you to see our beautiful campus for those of you joining us from great distances today, although today we are surrounded by a blizzard, as luck would have it. Um, and I am really lucky to direct the psychology law and neural development research and policy group um, here in the Department of Psychology with a talented group of graduate and undergraduate students um, who've made really important contributions to the research uh, that I'm going to share with you today. By way of disclosure, I don't have any financial relationship to the program, and I would like to acknowledge that my research is funded by Canadian, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and the Canada FASD Research Network. Um, and these are my views and the collection of my sort of insights and synthesis of the evidence base related to FASD and forensic contexts. So today um, I'm going to focus on three key learning objectives and a bit of a whirlwind tour balancing sort of clinical um, and forensic considerations for this population. And by the end of the presentation, uh, my goal is for you to be able to identify uh, the key clinical features and signs of FASD, as well as be knowledgeable about how often you may run into FASD in community and other high risk um, populations and settings. To have a better understanding of the relevance and experiences of individuals with FASD in forensic and criminal justice as context, and also to understand the evidence base with respect to forensic practice and practice specific to FASD, um, a body of literature which I would say from a practice perspective is really best characterized as emerging at this stage. So I'm going to begin with a bit of a primer and a clinical uh, background um, warm up about FASD because I'm sure that like myself, for many of you, um, learning and um, coursework and training about this common neural developmental disorder wasn't a formal part of my graduate um, training or training as a clinician. I first learned about FASD by happenstance on a forensic clinical practicum and have been um, working in the research area with some clinical work as well uh, for about 15 years at this time. So feel free to ask questions uh, if I don't get to get to everything and you have questions sort of left over after this quick whirlwind overview. Um, FASD is a term that's broadly used to characterize the lifelong neural developmental impacts experienced uh, by individuals who are exposed to alcohol prenatally and these impacts are wide ranging um, and, uh, uh, and can occur in the context of many impairments that are both brain and body related. Um, as I'll share with you, FASD is a common neural developmental disorder that's really marked by complex both inter and intra variability, intra individual variability, and it's often characterized as a disability group with wide ranging heterogeneity and presentations um, and a lot of complex and intersecting needs. Um, these needs, as I'm going to share with you as we go through the talk today, can make it quite tricky to identify um, folks who may have FASD and also effectively address all the complex needs um, that are commonly presented in individuals with this disability. Um, while all individuals are likely to experience difficulties and deficits and need supports to reach their healthiest outcomes, it's also important to recognize that, like everyone, individuals with FASD have their own unique strengths that can be built upon to also support healthier outcomes. So I just thought I'd briefly touch on alcohol as a teratogen. Um, FASD is unique in some ways amongst neural developmental disorders as a result of the known cause um, of the impairment associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. So alcohol is a very potent teratogen and can disrupt prenatal development and negatively affect the developing fetus across all stages of pregnancy. Um, and it's considered an equal opportunity teratogen such that it can impact um, a developing fetus in any person at any stage. Um, there are lots of risk factors that sort of 
combine and co-occur and intersect to produce potentially um, worse and more serious outcomes. And these can include the dose and the timing fetal development of the exposure, as well as maternal risk factors um, such as older age or poor nutrition or lower socioeconomic status, as well as the unique combination of genetic and epigenetic um, interactions between um, mom and baby in the developing um, in these early stages of development. A really important message um, that I like to reiterate when I talk about FASD um, to help clear up some of the confusion around misperceptions around whether some or low levels of alcohol may be safe um, to provide by way of recommendation um, in terms of supporting the healthiest outcomes for folks who are pregnant, but really the best um, evidence at this stage and the lack of evidence supporting any level of um, al safe alcohol use in pregnancy um, to put it another way, there's been no threshold of alcohol use in pregnancy that's been definitively shown through evidence to be proven safe. And the most helpful and healthy messaging is to um, be clear that exposure to alcohol at any time during a pregnancy can have an adverse effect on fetal development. So we like to say no safe time and no safe kind. Um, and I don't have time to talk about um, sort of more specific preventative strategies for helping support healthy pregnancies and healthy um, outcomes um, for moms and families families and babies, but it is a really important area to think about in your practice, particularly if you're working um, uh, with women clinically. So it's a little bit tough at this stage to uh, provide a reliable or really precise estimate of the rates or prevalence of FASD in community settings. Estimates vary for a lot of reasons. There are not a whole huge number of really um, generalizable widespread spread population level studies. And as I'm going to share with you in a little bit, the diagnostic criteria and terminology that we use to identify and diagnose folks on the FASD spectrum vary from place to place. Um, at this stage, data from the US and the Canada, and sorry, from the US and Canada suggest that uh, the prevalence of FASD broadly in the general population based on voluntary enrollment um, case ascertainment studies conducted in young school-aged children tell us that anywhere from around 1 to 4% of the general population could have FASD. Um, and these estimates are thought to be conservative for reasons I'm going to tell you about today. Um, in Canada, the Canada FASD Research Network estimates that prevalence is conservative conservatively sits at around 4%. So this is a very common um, neural developmental disorder. Further to that, we see much, much, much more elevated rates in vulnerable populations. Um, and so recent reviews have shown us that in child welfare contexts, special education classrooms, and importantly, in criminal justice contexts, those prevalence rates are much higher. And I'm going to show you some data uh, about that in just a little bit. FASD comes with um, really significant economic impact from a range of cost drivers associated with providing support across health, education, justice, child welfare, um, employment, and so on, um, to provide the kinds of supports that people with this complex disability need um, to do well and really um, have healthy outcomes. Um, data from the US suggests that the cost per person for FASD could conservatively range from between one or two million dollars. And in Canada, Canada, uh, a recent national estimate suggested that nationally the costs associated with FASD range from anywhere around between two and ten billion dollars. And concerningly, uh, um, one of the highest cost drivers associated with FASD based on these health economic analyses is actually costs associated with administration of involvement in the criminal justice system. So costs related to courts, policing charges, um, dispositions, corrections, and so forth. Um, and that's quite concerning for a, a neural developmental disability to have justice related costs as among the highest economic drivers associated with the disability. Another key message that I think is really important for us to all sort of share as we do our work in relation to working with people with FASD in forensic and clinical contexts broadly is that FASD occurs in the context of the social determinants of health. And really what we mean there is that FASD can occur in any and all populations 
or people where alcohol is used. Um, and there are lots of risk factors thought to be associated with higher rates of risk of prenatal alcohol exposure um, related to economic stability, social and community contexts, health. Um, but it, there is no evidence at this stage to suggest that there's any unique genetic or otherwise kind of susceptibility in groups or communities, that this is really um, a, a disorder and disability driven by rates of alcohol use in communities. So I'll talk a little bit next about diagnostic considerations. And I mentioned earlier that there is some challenge um, identifying prevalence that stems from the variability in diagnostic guidelines and terminology and criteria that are available. There are multiple sets of international diagnostic guidelines. And while they all share a few features in common, they do tend to use different terms um, and have slight variations in the diagnostic criteria used to actually make a diagnosis. So the term FASD tends to be used to describe sort of as an umbrella term the full range of impairments that are caused by prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, and there are a variety of diagnoses that can be made under that term, including fetal alcohol syndrome, partial fetal alcohol syndrome, um, fetal alcohol effects, alcohol-related neural, development, neural developmental disorders. And so I think it's important to be familiar with the fact that these different terms fall under um, a, a broad umbrella related to prenatal alcohol exposure, but they all carry slightly different um, clinical meanings and have slightly different signs and symptoms associated with the diagnosis. Um, diagnostic systems vary internationally and for lots of good reasons that I think are relevant to our work as forensic clinicians, there has been an increasing call to try and harmonize um, both the criteria and the terminology that we use to help um, simplify our work and make communication around the deficits um, associated with the disability easier. Um, However, across different systems, most include the common recommendation, recommendation that clinicians um, include uh, that clinicians um, have special training and are FASD informed if they're going to go about making a diagnosis of FASD or working um, closely with a client who may have FASD, and that the best sort of gold standard remains a multidisciplinary um, team approach to diagnosis that commonly includes a physician, um, this may be a pediatrician or a a family physician or a dysmorphologist, a geneticist, um, as well as a psychologist or neuropsychologist. And then depending on the age and stage that we're talking about, other members may also be part of the diagnostic team, including speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, and social workers. Most systems also emphasize the fact that the assessment of FASD in order to make a diagnosis should be broad and comprehensive um, and often involves um, an extensive sort of psychological assessment as well as a developmental assessment and medical evaluation. So I'm gonna show you some of the key diagnostic features that in one, in one way or another are considered in most diagnostic guidelines. And there are sort of four main areas that um, are commonly considered when making a decision as to whether a diagnosis under the FASD umbrella makes sense. The first relates to facial dysmorphology. And here we're talking about the key sentinel facial features. So having a smooth philtrum, so that like um, groove right above your lip, a thin circumference of your upper lip and short palpable fissure lengths. Um, those three features together are actually thought when present together um, to be quite specific to the effects of prenatal alcohol um, exposure um, during development. However, um, it can be a little bit um, challenging to identify FASD because evidence increasingly is telling us that the majority of folks with FASD don't actually present uh, with overt or discernible facial dysmorphology. And what this means is that FASD is common referred to as an invisible or difficult to detect disability because there aren't um, sort of key cardinal overt physical features that are easy to see and folks with the disability tend to be misunderstood and misdiagnosed. Um, but for some, when there's a sufficient amount of alcohol that um, is, is um, exposed during weeks three or four during those early stages of fetal development, there can be um, dysmorphic facial, facial changes. Some diagnostic systems um, recognize the importance of um, restricted fetal growth and will use measurements of head circumference, height, and weight um, as considerations when making a diagnostic determination. 
And for most of us, thinking from a psychological perspective or as perhaps non-medical clinicians or clinicians who aren't working in an interdisciplinary um, diagnostic team, um, we'll see considerable and wide ranging neural developmental impairment across domains, including cognition and both behavioral and affect regulation. And I'm gonna unpack those a little bit more for you in a moment. Depending on the diagnostic system, um, prenatal alcohol exposure is typically required to be confirmed. And as you can imagine, this can make it complicated um, if you can't get reliable information confirming um, an above minimum threshold exposure to alcohol or use of alcohol during pregnancy. Um, some diagnostic guidelines, when the presence of other features are there, don't require this a confirmation of prenatal alcohol use, but in most cases, it is required to confirm. And this can be quite challenging, particularly when working with older adolescents and adults and trying to get this information retrospectively for many reasons, um, including stigma, um, legal concerns about disclosure and what that could mean for um, any potential legal implications for the child or other children in the family, um, and a traditional blaming and shaming of uh, women and mothers around use of alcohol in pregnancy. I also wanted to show you um, a, a current um, uh, condition for further study that's included in the DSM. So it can't be diagnosed at this stage. It's included in the back um, section called Neural Behavioral Disorder Associated with PAE. And this um, diagnosis is proposed um, to include more than minimal PAE with a confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure, along with recognized deficits in neurocognitive function, um, various elements of self-regulation, and also um, adaptive functioning. And here, the, the, the physical or facial dysmorphology component you'll notice isn't present and so you can also diagnose relevant um, disorders under the FASD spectrum if they're also present as well. Um, but the inclusion of this um, diagnosis in DSM for further study um, signals the likelihood that many of us are going to be um, faced with thinking about how to make a diagnosis or work with diagnostic information um, increasingly, particularly as it makes it into the next edition of the, of the DSM and other um, international approaches approaches to diagnostic classification of, of mental and physical health problems. So I've alluded a couple of times to the fact that it can be challenging to identify individuals with FASD, and this occurs for a number of reasons. I've touched on the fact that in our research shows as many as 90% of cases, there's a lack of limited overt physical features. And so children at young ages often go missed or misdiagnosed or misclassified as having um, different kinds of disruptive behavioral problems, externalizing problems, ADHD, and you'll often see a complex slew of diagnoses trying to capture the difficulties that um, at that age children experience who have FASD. We also, from a cognitive profile perspective, and I'll show you some data on this in a moment, can see real variations in the domains of cognitive functioning that are impacted from person to person and like like many other conditions a masking of deficits so you may have um, an overall uh, iq or overall level of intellectual functioning that's sort of borderline or low average with much more prominent prominent deficits in executive functioning or memory um, or language related deficits that can be sort of hidden um, and not obvious until you really start getting into a more comprehensive evaluation. And this can contribute to not only misdiagnosis, missed diagnosis, but misdiagnosis. As I've mentioned, getting um, reliable information to confirm prenatal alcohol exposure can be challenging, particularly with age. Um, and FASD traditionally has been a very stigmatizing condition, um, stigmatized as being sort of um, folks who have bad behavior um, and are, you know, there are thoughts around families and responsibility um, uh, tied to the disorder. And uh, many clinicians report reluctance and families report reluctance around wanting to actually have this label applied. Um, and we hear clinically that often um, alternative diagnostic labels that capture some of the difficulties like ADHD plus maybe um, different kinds of externalizer or mood related difficulties applied rather than uh, a label of FASD. 
Uh, internationally, we have very limited diagnostic capacity. Several years ago in Canada, um, someone did an estimate of how many diagnostic clinic spots there were. And in any given year, they thought there were around 2,000. Uh, but if you apply, for instance, the 4% prevalence rate to the Canadian population, that's at any given point in time, 1.4 million people. So between limited clinician knowledge and limited um, multidisciplinary, uh, um, specially trained teams available to make the diagnosis, this can further lead to identification challenges. And last, I'm going to show you some information about um, professional knowledge in forensic clinicians in particular a little bit later in this presentation, but a number of surveys of professional practices and knowledge about FASD in justice and mental health professionals um, tell us that they feel that they don't have enough knowledge and experience to really provide competent care and very much would like more training to be able to um, have better knowledge and skill and support the needs of this vulnerable population. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour looking at some of the clinical criteria and characteristics, um, thinking about uh, prevalence and uh, the diagnosis of FASD. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the specific clinical features through a forensically relevant lens at this stage moving forward in the presentation. So at the beginning of the presentation, I talked to you about this. If we take sort of the, the the higher end, let's say, of the estimate of, of the general prevalence of FASD in the Canadian population sitting at around 4% here. The rest of the data here are drawn from individual prospective case ascertainment studies where a research team went into either a forensic program or a specific correctional institution and enrolled as many people as they could prospectively in a study over a fixed period of time to look at how many people um, across the population would meet diagnostic criteria for FASD. And so you can see that from one study conducted in Canada in a male um, federal correctional population prevalence sat at around 10%. We um, published research um, the year before last based on a prevalence study that we conducted in a northern Canadian correctional jurisdiction and found 17% prevalence of FASD in that institution. One of the earliest studies in this area completed in 1999 in Canada also found 23% of youth admitted to an inpatient um, forensic assessment program over an 18 month period met diagnostic criteria. And the year before last in Australia, um, a series of researchers found 36% of um, incarcerated youth in the detention center met diagnostic criteria. And two important features I think are worth highlighting based on this body of these, these collection of studies. The first is that in all of these studies, prevalence could have actually been much higher because it is difficult to get um, confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure in these research contexts. Um, so in our study in the Northern Canadian jurisdiction, I think uh, the prevalence could have been as high as 30, 31% as opposed to 17%. Um, and the second thing to know is that in all of these studies, the vast majority of folks who were enrolled had never been previously identified as having a diagnosis on the FASD spectrum, as many as 80 to 97% of folks enrolled in these studies. So on the one hand, we don't wanna to make too broad of generalizations about the prevalence of FASD in forensic and correctional contexts based on a small number of studies with a relatively small number of folks enrolled, um, as lots of factors related to jurisdiction and geography could certainly impact how well these carry over to other jurisdictions. But these studies combined with other evidence that we have, and I'm going to talk to you a bit more about that today, um, really do start to cement and provide an evidentiary basis for the overrepresentation or certainly the elevated rates of folks with FASD in correctional and forensic contexts. When looking at clinical samples, and I'll show you some data from one of these today of folks who have attended FASD diagnostic clinics in the United States and in Canada, um, between 30 and 60% of folks in those published studies have reported having some kind of contact with the legal or criminal justice system. And combining all of these data, um, estimates suggest that youth with FASD are 19 times more likely to be incarcerated compared to youth without FASD, and that broadly the rates of FASD are 30 times greater in correctional settings as compared to the general population. 
So this should signal to us as forensic clinicians that we need to be aware that in our practice, we are likely going to have contact with individuals with either prenatal alcohol exposure or who may meet diagnostic criteria for FASD, who may not have actually ever been previously recognized, even if we're working with adults. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more specifically today about the legal implications of FASD, but looking broadly at a review of case law decisions internationally, we've seen FASD as a disability um, sort of accepted and considered relevant across a range of criminal matters and cases, um, including um, decisions at sentencing in terms of determinations of disposition, looking at whether FASD should be considered as a mitigating or aggregating factor um, in transfer decisions and in the United States in capital decisions and internationally and decisions around special provisions around dangerousness for extended kinds of sentences. We also see case law looking at adjudicative competence, the voluntariness of waiver, admissibility of statements, and uh, in a more limited way around insanity um, cases and criminal responsibility. And so you can see that there's a broad range of a relevant forensic assessment and intervention contexts where we may need to think about how to effectively consider and assess both clinical and forensic considerations for people with FASD in our practice. Um, and FASD broadly is seen by many at this stage to challenge common assumptions of the criminal justice system. And this can be an area that we sort of need to navigate when we're doing evaluations or making recommendations. Um, in particular, the premise or the idea that the assumption that people act in a voluntary manner that's determined by sort of individual free will and that individuals have the necessary capacities and abilities to make informed and voluntary decisions with respect to their rights, decisions to commit crimes and to, for instance, um, adhere to conditions of supervision on release. Um, and the principles of individual responsibility may not be appropriate assumptions in this case. And a number of legal scholars have suggested that applying traditional um, dispositions or means of um, adjudicating and, and um, managing or supervising um, individuals with FASD uh, who come into the contact with the criminal justice system may not produce the kinds of intended outcomes, reductions in recidivism and rehabilitation outcomes that they are designed um, to tackle. And this can be very frustrating for individuals, families, clinicians, um, and folks um, in the legal profession. Um, and uh, it people with FASD are commonly described as experiencing a revolving door um, cycle through the criminal justice system, where by the time they enter the system, they're just not able to um, effectively engage or follow supervision and rehabilitate, rehabilitation considerations and desist and exit the system. So I'm going to talk for just a moment and bring some data slides here around some of the research that we've conducted in our lab um, over the last 10 years or so, looking at um, sort of cognitive and complexity, clinical complexity related uh, components that I think are relevant to forensic and correctional practice for psychologists and clinicians. So when I mentioned that neurodevelopmental impairment is a core feature, particularly var variable um, impairments in neurodevelopmental functioning, these are the domains under the Canadian diagnostic criteria for FASD that are considered. And so we may see deficits across any of these areas. Um, particularly relevant to criminal justice considerations include overall cognition. Um, many samples show that 40, 50, 60% of folks with FASD may meet criteria um, or have an overall intellectual functioning score at around um, a standard score of 70, which is a common benchmark that is considered when making um, a diagnosis of intellectual disability. But many folks do not have overall cognition that falls in that um, very severely impaired range and maybe more borderline or low average in functioning. At the same time, while they may have that overall cognitive score, higher order functioning related to language, memory, and in particular, a hallmark of FASD um, is thought to be around um, deficits in executive functioning. So the ability to plan, um, organize oneself, inhibit um, urges, and um, engage sort of a really behaviorally effective ways that can flex um, and shift to meet the needs of any given situation are commonly seen as impaired in this population, as are um, pretty significant impairments in adaptive functioning. 
So just to give you a picture of what this looks like, these data are drawn from the um, prevalence study that I told you about just a few minutes ago in the Northern Canadian correctional population. And here you have data from 80 um, adults ages 18 to 40 years, um, including both men and women who were all justice involved. And on the bottom, um, sorry, the, the Z score line got off my Y axis just a little bit, but you can see that here zero would be reflective of average or sort of average neurotypical functioning. And so those that ended up being diagnosed with FASD across domains, including cognition, academics, attention, and executive functioning, experienced impairment across different kinds of measures in these domains, ranging as low on average as two and a half standard deviations below the average, um, whereas a group of folks who didn't have any neural developmental or neurocognitive impairment, you can see much more so here in the group that's labeled as green followed um, the, the, the average general population mean score. Um, those who we couldn't rule out prenatal alcohol exposure and thus FASD, um, who may have met diagnostic criteria, you can see in the red group here with the dashed lines, looked much closer to those who ultimately were diagnosed with FASD. And both of those groups experienced lower cognitive functioning as compared to um, a group with neuro um, central nervous system deficits or deficits in cognitive functioning, but with prenatal alcohol exposure ruled out. So you can just sort of see the, the depth and breadth of the impairment um, from this one study as an example. Um, here are data from um, adolescents and adults who were seen in diagnostic clinics across Canada between 2016 and 2020. And again, you see those same domains of neural developmental impairment across the bottom. And here, rather than average sort of standard scores, we were looking at how many um, folks across each of these domains of impairment had significantly impaired functioning, often measured at one and a half or two standard deviations below the mean on standardized measures of cognitive functioning in these areas. And so I show you this shot slide just to show you the very broad range um, of impairment seen in this sample. And to also show you that irrespective of whether people presented with the dysmorphic facial features and other kind of physical indicators associated with PAE or without, um, overall rates of impairment were pretty comparable and quite high. So by way of example, in the domain of executive functioning, over 80% of people who received the diagnosis through clinic, um, so nearly 80% of folks had significant impairment in the domain of executive functioning. Not only do they have lots of individual areas of, of impairment, but here I've shown you the mean number of domains. So here of these 10 neural developmental domains, on average, they had significant impairment in between five and six areas of impairment out of the 10. So variable impairment, but a great deal of impairment and across a lot of domains. These cognitive impairments and impairments in neural developmental functioning can lead to lots of behavioral presentations that I think are highly relevant for legal considerations across a range of psycholegal abilities and correctional and forensically relevant decisions. So folks with FASD are commonly described as having very significantly impaired ability to reason, communicate, make reasoned decisions um, that weigh consequences appropriately. Um, lots of these kinds of impairments are similar for those of you who attended the webinar last week around sort of very young adolescents and their decision-making and risk-taking behaviors. Um, folks with FASD are commonly described as having very um, delayed or immature psychosocial skills and being more suggestible and at risk of potentially, for instance, confabulating during interviews or um, at the far end of the spectrum entering um, invalid false confessions. Um, folks with FASD and other neural developmental disabilities are often described as seemingly remorseless when it may be more reasonable to understand um, this inability to show sort of an emotional um, taking of responsibility and understanding of consequences through a neurotypical lens, which is commonly expected um, in legal contexts. Um, we see a lot of inappropriate or maladaptive behavior, including some evidence suggesting inappropriate um, uh, common, um, commonly 
commonly demonstrated um, rates of inappropriate sexual behavior, problems with thinking flexibly, problems with predicting consequences, and problems with adhering to conditions. So we hear commonly um, from folks in the field talking about how um, individuals with FASD, even if they say that they understand when you talk with them about the conditions they have to follow for community supervision or release or bail, um, have real difficulty remembering those conditions and actually making decisions and choices that don't involve breaching those decisions. And so we see um, common concerns around high rates of administration of justice or breach related charges for this population as well. Compounding this cognitive and neurodevelopmental impairment are very elevated rates of adverse prenatal and postnatal life experiences. And you'll recognize many of these um, cognitive and adversity related factors as factors that also increase risk for, for involvement in the criminal justice system, increase risk for recidivism and for poor outcomes. So a number of studies show that youth with FASD uh, experience a whole range of additional prenatal exposures and adversities, such as um, concurrent substance exposure, um, early preterm birth, um, and other kinds of difficulties. They are experience common um, disruptions in their caregiving placements, involvement in contact with the child welfare system and foster care placements, um, abuse, ne neglect and trauma at much elevated rates, um, stressful household exposures, and then later um, additional difficulties sort of getting by and having healthy engagements with developmentally expected outcomes. So we see lots of disruption from school and difficulties in school related to both behavioral challenges as well as um, academic skill difficulties, precarious housing, difficulty obtaining and maintaining employment in the early adulthood period, um, difficulty um, living independently, and as I've mentioned, elevated rates of trouble with the law. These data come from that same study of adolescents and adults that I showed you just a moment ago, seen in Canadian diagnostic clinics, and we wanted to take a snapshot of current difficulties being experienced in everyday life by folks as they attended clinic. And so here you can see the data divided into adolescents, transitioned age youth, so around ages 18 to 24 years, at that precarious time that's often quite a vulnerable period for individuals with FASD and other neural developmental disabilities, as well as adults. And so we see the expected um, significant differences in age differences and trends. So much uh, elevated rates of problems with employment, for instance, for transition age um, adults and youth and lower rates of that difficulty for adolescents. But here across this entire sample of 726 individuals, you can see that by age between 24 and 36 percent of folks had had some were experiencing some kind of legal difficulty related to offending and as many as 10 percent of adults Adults in this sample were incarcerated at the time of their clinical evaluation. We also see very high rates of both alcohol and substance misuse um, across the age span, speaking to further compounded risk. On this slide, I'm showing you data from a different study that we conducted a number of years back that you may have heard me speak about before, where we um, proactively enrolled 50 justice-involved adolescents ages 12 to 23, so including that transitioned age to youth period, as with FASD, as well as 50 adolescents who were justice-involved and transitioned age youth who did not have FASD. And we looked at some of these early experiences of, of adversity and clinical needs in the population, and we found not surprising surprisingly, because rates of these kinds of difficulties are very elevated in justice and correctional and forensic populations broadly, high rates of these experiences across both groups of youth, but significantly elevated rates of physical abuse, neglect, and child welfare involvement for youth with FASD who are justice involved specifically. From a clinical perspective, we also saw very high rates of psychiatric comorbidity, including um, indicators of prior psychiatric hospitalizations, use of psychiatric medications, and substance, past substance use treatment. We also saw concerningly much elevated rates of suicide attempts compared to our non-FASD group in the youth with FASD, as well as um, very serious overdose experiences in relation um, to drug use. And so this is, uh, building on growing evidence suggesting that these kinds of be impulsive related behaviors tied to these adversity experiences can be particularly risky and warrant specialized consideration for forensic and correctional populations. So I just mentioned comorbidity. It's 
very common and in fact more so the rule than the exception that somebody with FASD may also have a comorbid mental, mental or physical health concerns. So estimates have suggested that rates of comorbid diagnosis of mental health problems range as high as 90% across different samples of youth with FASD. Um, some of the most common um, comorbid diagnoses for mental health considerations include ADHD, um, externalizing disorders, and um, internalizing problems related to anxiety and depression, so mood-related difficulties. And uh, a systematic review from a few years ago showed that physical health problems occur at very elevated rates in, in, in individuals with FASD. This is consistent with elevated rates of physical health problems in individuals with other neural developmental disabilities. Um, and I've just put together some of the common things that you see present comorbidly in individuals with FASD, ranging from sleep disorders, eye conditions, additional kinds of genetic problems or dysmorphology, elevated rates of seizure disorders, dental and palate problems, and asthma and respiratory problems. And I highlight this for you so that you think again about the comprehensive um, and complex nature of the kinds of difficulties that are likely to impact somebody's success in terms of having healthy outcomes and that warrant careful evaluation and intervention, um, irrespective of whether they're being seen in a clinical or forensic or correctional setting. So owing to this overrepresentation and um, elevated rates of this sort of vulnerable disability group in justice related contexts over the last decade, we've seen sort of wide ranging calls for policy change. Um, and they include lots of different options, including the notion that courts should have more access to clinical information about FASD when making legal decisions about defendants. Um, and that the same is true for being able to craft um, effective super supervision plans um, and correctional management. Um, and as a result of these wide ranging calls, we anticipate that the need for um, more comprehensive and carefully um, focused forensic evaluations that can answer legal questions, um, looking at that forensic nexus between clinical symptoms and forensically relevant psycholegal abilities or um, other variables that are needed to help uh, provide the information for the courts and legal decision makers um, to ultimately render decisions um, is likely to increase. We're currently wrapping up um, a near decade long, we haven't been doing it for a decade, although sometimes it feels like that with research, um, a review of Canadian case law involving criminal cases where a defendant was thought to potentially have FASD over a seven year period between 2013 um, and 2020 based on reported decisions. And we've looked at 240 criminal cases and anticipate being able to pre present more fulsome results from this study um, in the next couple of months. Uh, not surprisingly, we found thus far that most cases involving a defendant with FASD or possible FASD focused on sentencing or the rendering of dispositions. Um, and of, of interest, I think, to our focus here as forensic clinicians, very few cases reported a current evaluation of FASD undertaken th through sort of a clinical lens or a forensic lens in the context of the legal decision and matter at hand. And in all of these cases, only half involved um, con a confirmed mention of an actual diagnosis, formal diagnosis of FASD. And so what we commonly see is that a person may have FASD or they may have had prenatal alcohol exposure, or there's some suggestion that they could have FASD um, without a lot of great evidence presented to suggest that a recent comprehensive evaluation has taken place. A number of decisions um, that we've reviewed where the judge um, or judges really took time considering the disability related evidence highlighted um, the challenge around a lack of expert testimony and feeling that they had insufficient information at hand linking sort of the, de the relevant deficits to the legal issue again about that forensic nexus that's so important that I talked to you about earlier. And in looking at disposition outcomes, we often see a theme that uh, legal decision makers are trying to balance, where on the one hand, they're recognizing that clinical evidence and disability related expert um, evidence um, should serve a mitigating role um, and speak to reduced moral blameworthiness or culpability. 
but on the other hand, feeling that um, many of the factors that are experienced by a person with FASD um, can result in increased and difficult to manage risk. And this is compounded by a broad, wide ranging lack of uh, appropriate intervention and supportive resources that could effectively manage that risk in the community. So we see decision makers really trying to weigh how to balance those interests. Um, and in very serious cases, often this then results in uh, lengthy custodial sentences or in um, adult sentences or transfers for youth, for instance. So stay tuned. Um, and I'd really like to acknowledge my graduate student, um, Caitlin Mullally's work on this project and our team of undergraduate research assistants who have been busy reviewing and coding um, work on this project. Because I'm a forensic clinician and because we have concerns that many legal and other cl clinical professionals um, may not have sufficient knowledge or training about FASD, we just actually wrapped up a professional practices survey and if any of you completed it for us, thank you very much, um, looking at knowledge and practice experience and training needs of forensic clinicians. Most of those who responded were forensic psychologists or clinical psychologists with forensic practice experience in order to really try and understand and future training needs. Um, and in keeping with what we anticipated, most folks in the study indicated that they had some FASD relevant practice experience, but the large majority felt that they didn't have really enough training experiences, knowledge or skill to feel adequately prepared for forensic practice. So here you can see some data for that from that study. Um, with on the left side, you see um, uh, clinician ratings for their preparedness for forensic practice in working with individuals who may have FASD in, in forensic assessment or intervention contexts as compared to their perceived uh, readiness for practice around working with other uh, clients who may have other neural developmental disabilities like ADHD, intellectual disability, um, specific learning disabilities, or autism. And so broadly looking at feeling prepared for practice, feeling prepared to identify folks with a disability, diagnose them, or conduct forensic assessment or intervention. Many clinicians felt really inadequately prepared, and we had um, many feel very strongly that additional training was required for them to um, really practice competently with this population. Just checking my time, I'm doing okay. I'm going to show you a couple of studies um, looking at specific areas of forensic relevant sort of clinical data and practice that we've completed over the last couple of years, uh, beginning with risk. So um, the study that I talked to you earlier about that involved adolescents with and without FASD who were just as involved, we specifically completed risk assessment measures with these youth, including the SAVERY and the YLS CMI, um, and established some early promise with respect to the validity of using these tools with this population. Um, and we also looked at sort of their offending characteristics. And we found that youth with FASD in this study had an earlier age of first arrest that they had a very high rate of recidivism or rearrest in our one year follow up period. So 92% um, at baseline were rated as high risk to reoffend, and they had more rapid and higher recidivism rates during our follow up period. Um, there was no difference in terms of the type of offense that youth in this study had committed. So they were broadly involved a mix of folks engaged in both violent and nonviolent offending. Um, significantly more youth with FASD in this sample transition to the adult justice system. And we found that protective factors played a really critical but inverse role related to recidivism. So youth with FASD presented with many fewer protective factors, but the absence of those factors was very strongly related to increased recidivism risk. Um, so you can check out that paper if you're looking for um, more evidence supporting uh, the validity of forensic tools um, in this population. So here are some of the risk factors and domains that we looked at comparing youth with FASD without. And so you can see that uh, historical factors related to um, early offense histories and other kinds of early abuse experiences, for instance, as well as the individual clinical factors related to impulsivity, for instance, and aggressiveness um, were significantly elevated in the youth with FASD as compared to the youth who didn't have FASD. And the same pattern was true looking at data from the youth level of service case management in the inventory. 
We've also completed research looking at deficits in psycholegal abilities, re relevant adjudicative competency, and rights comprehension, so understanding their rights upon arrest, Miranda rights, or charter rights, depending on where you live. Um, and also, um, I'll, I won't show you data on this, but we did find elevated rates of false past uh, past false confessions or false confessions in the context of plea deals at a rate of around 40% in that sample. Um, and this won't come as much of a surprise um, given some of the cognitive and communication and thinking and reasoning deficits that I've described. Um, but in this same sample of justice involved youth that I've been telling you about, we found higher rates of impairment in those with FASD across psycholegal abilities relevant to um, rights comprehension using the Miranda rates comprehension um, instruments, as well as understanding, appreciation, and communication using the fitness interview test revised. Um, and combining subtests across those two measures, we found that 90% of youth showed significant impairment in one or more relevant psycholegal abilities in consideration of competence. So I think this is an important area for us to be thinking about when um, conducting competency evaluations, particularly with youth with FASD. Um, this is just a little side journey into talking about forensic assessment instruments. We know that it's really critical that there be scientific sort of um, psychometric um, reliability and val validity and broad acceptance of the utility of forensic assessment instruments when using them um, in forensic evaluations. And there has certainly been increased attention to the relevance of being able to generalize data from broad populations to specific subgroups, either based on personal characteristics or on clinical characteristics. These data that I'm showing you here are just showing you um, the, the percentage, it shouldn't, sorry, it should say percentage, not proportion, of forensic clinicians in that knowledge and practice survey that I was telling you about who report using forensic assessment measures in their practice. And so what the data tell us is that forensic assessment uh, uh, instruments across risk evaluations, um, psychopathy, and competency-based measurement are used frequently in this population but there's a, a fairly limited body of evidence really showing that their psychometric characteristics hold up in this population. Um, the study that I told you about earlier, looking at the Savory and the YLS CMI, seemed to show um, utility in terms of predictive um, considerations around recidivism. But I think an important consideration needs to be made as well, ensuring that the clinician has appropriate knowledge and training about FASD such that they're using the instrument and interpreting items in a way that's consistent with the needs and deficits of this population and understanding what kinds of limitations um, that may place on their clinical opinions and results using these measures. We, um, turning back to that sample of 80 justice involved adults from our prevalence study, um, in northern Canada for justice involved adults, we did look at many indicators of performance validity or effort, um, measures of performance validity and effort focusing on um, feigned or um, under performance, particularly on cognitive measures like the WACE, um, as well as um, Green's word memory test form very common and in fact indicated components of forensic evaluations, particularly when completing cognitive testing. Um, and when we looked at the number of individual performance validity indicators failed in those with FASD or those who we thought may meet criteria for FASD if PAE could have been confirmed as compared to those adults who were justice involved but where FASD was ruled out, we saw that the adults with FASD were significantly more likely likely to fail any single PVT and also failed a greater number of PVTs overall at greater rates as compared to the non-FASD group. So I think you want to be thinking carefully in working with a client who may potentially have FASD about how and if you're going to apply commonly used performance validity tests. And this likely extends to considerations around malingering, though I haven't seen a lot of great data um, from um, forensic assessment instruments on um, that on the use of those tools in this population specifically. So just to draw your attention to, to exercising caution in the application of these tools with folks with FASD, much like you would with folks um, with other neurodevelopmental disabilities and intellectual um, disorder. Inter 
intervention and management um, opportunities and strategies sort of administered as usual when folks go unidentified and where there's not a clear understanding of the unique deficits and needs of individuals with FASD may not be effective and may also lead to their increased vulnerability in correctional contexts. We hear a lot of concerns about vulnerable folks being victimized, both in correctional contexts as well as in community. Um, and in community, we have found that um, appropriate sort of FASD informed programs and supports are limited and that really critically the research based supporting evidence based intervention um, for justice involved folks with FASD is, is, is very lacking. And so at this point, we don't know if traditionally administered or modified intervention or management programs will work effectively in folks with FASD, if we can draw from accommodated approaches that work um, in correctional um, uh, contexts, for instance, for folks with intellectual disability um, with individuals with FASD, we just don't have good data on that. And that's an area where much more research is needed. So what can we do today, sort of leaving the session? Um, what kinds of practice considerations can I leave you with? Well, I think at this stage, I've hopefully made the case for the need for increased training, not only around um, the more nuanced clinical considerations of folks with FASD broadly and specific considerations around the diagnostic criteria or system that would be most commonly used in your area of practice, but also about that intersection of the way those clinical deficits and needs presented in this population intersect with forensically relevant assessment or intervention needs. Screening and identification forms, forms a really critical area of our work. Um, we've recently completed a couple of studies, including we have a systematic review of screening tools for individuals with FASD under review right now. Um, I can't get into the details about these, but you'll see in the resources that I've included at the end of the talk, um, some, um, uh, some papers that discuss screening options for forensic and correctional context in particular. And these include self-report questionnaires, informant related um, informant rated tools as well as structured interviews. But the finding from our systematic review is that much like the intervention literature, the literature um, talking about sort of the psychometric properties and predictive utility, as well as the implementation effectiveness of using these tools really it remains lacking at this point. Um, more research is needed to understand if if decisions made using these tools will help improve uh, later clinical decisions and make accurate identifications. I don't think I need to reiterate this piece around comprehensive evaluation, but I do think that uh, a multidisciplinary approach is really needed where we can look at the neural developmental needs, the social and contextual needs of the family and environment, as well as the medical needs of individuals. Um, and in particular, there's an emerging literature talking about um, the complications from um, psychiatric medication use in this population um, and uh, appropriate medication algorithms uh, for treating and, and helping support some of the symptoms of FASD, um, particularly through a justice involved lens. And I think I've made the point about using a multidisciplinary approach and um, making referrals when needed. We can't all be experts at all clinical conditions. I think we need to be really great versatile recognizers of conditions, but also know when consultation uh, with uh, folks who are specialized in this area is going to help um, provide us with a more nuanced way of understanding and attending to the needs of this unique population. And much like we would adjust our practice and provide uh, accommodations for folks with a range of neural developmental disorders, the same may augment and improve practice and practice outcomes uh, for justice involved folks with FASD. So in our professional practices survey, uh, forensic clinicians reported very commonly making adjustments to practice as usual um, in ways that included um, using open-ended questions to ensure understanding and take additional time, um, using in-depth probing, um, simplifying language, 
frequently checking in on comprehension, for instance, asking folks to paraphrase uh, key components of informed consent, um, or making sure that they really understand a question before they answer it. Um, commonly making sure that they use an interpretive lens when um, talking about results from forensic assessment um, instruments in the context of, of considering cognitive and adaptive um, limitations in that broader profile, referring clients for specialized assessment, um, taking into consideration cultural a diversity factors, um, inviting support persons to be present for different clinical activities, and also thinking about environmental changes that may support um, an improved clinical outcome, such as um, having lowered lighting or using a quiet space and um, having a session rather than a very long session, many, many short sessions. These strategies will um, be sort of common um, tools that you have in your tool belt, um, I'm sure, based on the number of clients that you see and the, the, the high rates of complex needs in these populations. So just to sort of draw it to a close, I can see that there are lots of questions in the Q&A. Um, I, I hope I've less, left you um, with the message that individuals with FASD are overrepresented in justice context and experience really complex and forensically relevant deficits and needs. Uh, that forensic clinicians are very likely to encounter individuals with FASD in their practice and should ensure that they have the competency to be FASD informed um, and recognize folks who may not have already been recognized um, or misdiagnosed as they enter the system. And that additional training, um, practice guidance, and really critically um, research at the intersection of forensic and correctional sort of scholarship, as well as the clinical FASD field, is needed to best support approaches for clinical practice in this area and to inform policy reform, because policy reform without evidence um, can actually result in more harmful or adverse outcomes um, as compared to um, uh, making no changes at all. So I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators on all of this whirlwind tour of research that I've presented for you today, critically the participants in the clinics who have given of their time to share their experiences, um, funders who have made this research possible, and graduate students in my lab who contributed to many of the studies that I've talked to you today about, including um, Melissa Group, Caitlin Mullally, and Chantal Ritter, um, who are forensic research superstars in the making. Um, that's what I have to present for you today, and I'll turn it over to you, Julie, and if, if for those of you who have to leave, my contact information is here, and I'm very happy for you to email me if you have questions about any of the studies or papers that I talked about today in the presentation, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for everyone that's still on it, it is, we're at the hour, so you're welcome to hop off. We did post the link to the CEU a survey, so grab that, make sure you print a copy, save a copy, we do not email you copies. We also get lots of emails about um, if we're gonna send out the slides and if this is recorded. Yes, we will send out the slides, give us about a week. Yes, this is recorded. If you, um, I think Rachel actually sends out the, the link and the password but uh, with the slides, but if she doesn't, just email us and we'll send it to you. Okay, so let's start with some questions. We do, we have a lot of uh, really, really good questions. Um, let's see here. Is FASD exacerbated when the mother also consumes nicotine? And do you just employ the DSM for diagnostic purposes or is the new ICD also helpful even though there are some nosological correlations? Those are great questions. So there are a number of emerging studies trying to disentangle the cumulative or interacting effects of prenatal alcohol exposure with other substances. Um, we often see elevated rates of really potent comorbid substance exposure prenatally, like cocaine use. Um, there's a whole host of research right now looking at um, cannabis use with legalization um, and other kinds of factors. Um, I can't say that there's a really clear singular pattern around um, intersections of various substances, but we do know that with increased risk and increased prenatal adversity, we're increasing then the risk of the range and extent of kind of deficits that we may see see after the fact, and um, that a whole range of animal studies have, have are, and are very much helping to disentangle sort of the, 
the potency or interactive teratogenic impact of these kinds of substances. Um, in Canada, um, diagnostically, we still really rely on these specialty diagnostic guidelines, much more so as opposed to DSM. Um, some physicians will use ICD codes depending on the billing practices that are in place, uh, depending on where they work in the world um, for FAS. Um, and so I think in the United States, there are a couple of key diagnostic approaches. I've included a citation in the resources that compare many of the commonly used um, diagnostic guidelines. And that would be a helpful resource for you to check out in terms of thinking about which approach makes the most sense. Thank you. Um, other questions about comorbidity. So can you please address the issue of comorbidity with autism spectrum or the confusion between the two diagnoses? Sure. So um, a colleague of mine actually um, just um, put together a paper, and I wish I could tell you the key findings off the top of my head. Um, Dr. Valerie Temple just published a paper looking at the comorbid um, occurrence of FASD and autism, and we do see elevated risk um, of comorbidity for multiple neural developmental disorders in individuals with prenatal alcohol exposure. Autism is one example, um, in addition to um, uh, seizure disorders, for instance. And so I would say clinically, um, that's, a, that's a whole talk for another day. Um, I don't wanna unpack sort of the difference between FASD and autism in like a bite-sized question, but I'm very happy if you email me to send you that paper uh, because they do talk about differences in the profiles across those 10 um, neurocognitive domains for folks with FASD alone versus folks with FASD plus the onset of autism spectrum disorder. Um, and I would say it's the neural developmental variability um, that in some ways distinguish the two disorders. Um, there are some deficits in sort of social cognition and some of those other more traditional aspects of autism that we think about um, in terms of presentation, um, but I think that paper would prove a helpful resource for you, so feel free to reach out. Thank you. Um, can you also speak a bit on FASD and personality disorders? Um, this person is specifically interested in borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and histrionic personality disorder. Sure, so I don't have comorbid prevalence rates off the top of my head. I think I have data on that from our prevalence study. Um, I do think that given many of the diagnostic considerations, particularly around those more dysregulated areas of personality disorder, you can see either comorbid or misdiagnosis of these features um, presented. So that dysregulation, affect dysregulation, executive dysfunction, difficulty with sort of impulsivity and anger control. And then depending on the environmental experiences, like thinking about both types of disorders through a biopsychosocial model, you have this layer on top of early adversity and trauma that can produce many of those um, sort of in some ways similarly presenting characteristics. I think the thing that is separate uh, when you're thinking specifically about a diagnosis under the FASD umbrella is that you've got a confirmed prenatal teratid potent teratogenic exposure that has created clear um, structural, I didn't talk today about the changes at the structural and functional levels of brain development, but a whole host of functional and structural, structural studies demonstrate clear reductions in volume across areas of the brain and impact, uh, particularly around the frontal regions, um, and the corpus callosum in FASD that are really sensitively impacted. And so I would say that would be a bit of a unique feature to FASD, which isn't to say that you don't see neurological or, or brain um, functional, or functional or structural abnormalities in other personality disorders, but here you have sort of a known transgenic ide ideological cause that sets folks up um, for what is often described as sort of um, uh, an increased vulnerability or sensitivity model such that not only do they have these really significant prenatal impairments and vulnerabilities, but they are likely to have further adverse impact from later resulting developmental insults as compared to if they didn't have that increased vulnerability to begin with from the prenatal exposure. Thank you. The next question is, can you give some examples of what you would and would not consider sufficient evidence of prenatal alcohol exposure? Let's say prenatal care progress notes that state pervasive alcohol use or labor and delivery notes describing the mother as intoxicated versus a mother reporting it when she knows her son is facing the death penalty or a longstanding documented pattern of alcohol dependence, but not specifically during pregnancy. 
Yeah, so I hear in that question lots of questions, lots of sort of flags around what would be common risk considerations that might make us more concerned um, that prenatal alcohol exposure could have occurred. And so I have a couple of sort of thoughts about that. Each diagnostic system has some guidance around sort of the minimal threshold for what um, enough confirmed prenatal alcohol exposure could look like. They vary in terms of a number of binge drinking episodes in a fixed period of time or a number of drinks per week over a number of weeks of pregnancy as sort of setting these minimal thresholds and they vary by diagnostic guideline. Um, I think in practice we want to be, um, and I'm not saying that the person asking this question has made this assumption, but it reminded me of a really good teaching point. We want to be careful about um, looking for flags that could suggest um, that there may have been an increased risk of prenatal alcohol use in pregnancy and lots of the risk tools will um, sort of the screening tools will look at whether um, out problematic alcohol use in early childhood um, was present as a potential risk marker of increase but not necessarily present um, risk for alcohol exposure in pregnancy. At the same time, um, one of the things that I think is really important, no matter the age of the client that you're working with is taking a really thoughtful developmental history when you're thinking about somebody who may have they themselves experienced prenatal alcohol exposure and asking all clients in all assessments about that early developmental history and history of exposures without sort of making assumptions about who could or could not have been at increased risk for having that be present. I think the same is true in our clinical care of women as psychologists or in their medical care that we routinely screen all women, no matter their background or risk markers, um, for potential um, increased risk of having an alcohol exposed pregnancy so that we're not making assumptions about who may or may not be more likely at risk and inadvertently letting bias potentially um, into our clinical consideration, uh, but also so that we can make appropriate recommendations and referrals to provide supports to have healthier outcomes in both cases. So um, most of the guidelines provide some helpful guidance around what counts sort of as a reliable um, report or confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, and I think that when we're undertaking forensic evaluations, we have to put our forensic hats on and think about corroboration think about um, having information from multiple sources and thinking about um, validity in the context of our evaluation, but it, it certainly can be tricky. Sorry about that. No problem. Are there any clinical suggestions or treatment considerations for FASD and TBI? Oh, okay. So we we also see elevated rates of TBI, I mean, across correctional populations, but as well um, in individuals with FASD. And I don't have really handy sort of differential practice um, guidance off the top of my head, other than that, I think it's really important to consider cumulative adversity um, and injury. By the time we see adults with FASD, the diagnostic um, consideration can be sort of complicated by the fact that many folks who have had longer um, engagements in the criminal justice system have lived risky lifestyles that include prolonged patterns of risk-taking behaviors, prolonged patterns of um, difficulties related to substance use. Um, we see a high um, a rate of injuries and accidents, including head injuries and other kinds of difficulties in individuals with FA, um, FASD. And in particular, uh, there is very limited data, but some data to suggest um, much earlier um, mortality rates for some of this population. So I think you want to make sure that you're undertaking a really careful and comprehensive and nuanced sort of neuropsychological or cognitive assessment of their functioning across all areas. And you want to be considering um, whether, just like when we have somebody who might not have prenatal alcohol exposure as one of those competing variables, if they've had head injury, if they've had um, seizure disorder, if they've had uh, really problematic substance misuse or overdoses or um, you know those complicating factors that we think are gonna contribute to cognitive morbidity um, and, and impairment, we wanna consider all of these factors in our formulation um, and not necessarily ascribe everything to one cause or another. So it's tough to disentangle clinically, but relevant 
development. Um, I also think that particularly those of you working with younger kiddos, but also with adults, when you're thinking about adaptive functioning and safety considerations, it really is important to think about what level of independence folks that you're having may have across different areas of functioning and where they may be more vulnerable and need supports commonly provided in sort of more disability related contexts. So supports around um, healthy eating, supports around um, not they themselves um, continuing to be victimized by others, um, residential supports and, and those kinds of considerations. Okay, I'm gonna combine a few, um, I, they're actually more comments. So individuals are mentioning how the um, training and sort of uh, expertise in this area seems to be better in Canada than it is in the US. Um, another individual is um, commenting upon, you know, we have a lot of forensic psychologists and psychiatrists that attended this talk today, and they're curious how many of those in attendance have, attendance have actually used the diagnosis of FASD in a forensic evaluation. And then the third comment is really this idea of um, this individual believes that people have sort of an overconfidence in their abilities to be competent in this area and sort of commenting upon the work that he sees or individuals that take cases where this is an issue maybe isn't up to par for what he he believes it should be and just sort of the especially in the child protection and ju juvenile justice cases um, and kind of pointing out that this might be problematic. Yeah, I think it is really tricky. I know that, for instance, I didn't run into anything about FASD in my own clinical training until I accidentally came across a case in practice and thought, went to my supervisor and said, well, what do you think this means? And they hadn't really had a lot of exposure or experience either. And, and thanks to some really wise guidance from a, a mentor, the direction of my career changed to directions to try and help fill that evidentiary gap. Um, one of the things that we heard in the survey from clinicians was that um, there are a lot of barriers to being able to do effective practice in this area that are not necessarily controllable by them as individual clinicians. And these included not having enough time or cost resources allocated by um, the court or within their practice or um, within the hospital, let's say, or health system that they worked in to really actually be able to spend the time or consult and bring in other kinds of clinicians to do this comprehensive um, an evaluation. And we heard them say that they wanted more time and resources to actually be able to provide more comprehensive assessments and then recommendations for the courts as compared to what they were able to provide provide. Um, and in Canada in particular, the jurisdiction I'm most familiar with from a practice perspective, um, after adolescence, there are pretty limited opportunities to have a funded assessment that would actually be able to not only confirm whether FASD was present as a diagnosis, but really critically look at the functional profile for that individual of deficits, needs, and strengths. And that's really what's most critical in being able to provide sort of an individually informed and forensically relevant set of recommendations or treatment practices um, for this population. So on the one hand, I do think taking additional training, um, there are lots of great courses. I try to be a bit bipartisan in terms of not recommending one or the other. Um, the University of Washington in Seattle has some great clinical training. Um, they offer online courses. And also I was lucky at the beginning of my training to be able to travel to Washington and visit and participate in a training clinic. A few clinics in Canada have that model as well and likely across the US. Um, there are some online programs for training. So for instance, the Canada the FASD Research Network has um, a module or a workshop that's online that can be completed for free that sort of provides a foundations of FASD training experience. And then they, along with other organizations in the, in the states and worldwide, provide um, paid training opportunities um, for for diagnostic teams, for instance, who would like to begin doing interdisciplinary evaluations. So I would say that there is a need for more than sort of the snapshot I've provided today to really practice competently in the area and have enough knowledge and skill. Um, but one of the things that we've also recently recommended in our paper um, stemming from the Clinical Forensic Knowledge and Practices Survey is that some practice guidance for what enough training looks like and what um, evidence-based 
guidance for assessment and intervention and consult consultation best practices would look like, I think would also be really helpful um, to, to, to provide a clear standard um, that would meet sort of tell us where that bar is um, as a discipline. So I think that sort of gets at some of those questions. Um, there are lots of resources. It's sort of incumbent on the individual clinician to access them at this stage or the team. Um, but there are some real obstacles at a system level in place that doesn't support um, clinicians having enough time or resources to do the work that's needed. And, and I'm sure many of us and you have experienced um, how difficult and frustrating this can be when you feel like you're doing about a tenth of what's really needed to fulsomely address a question, particularly in cases involving, you know, very serious dispositions. So. Thank you. Um, next, we have a few questions about recommendations for people with FASD. So recommendations for probation, uh, minor children uh, in custody and divorce cases with high conflict. Um, let's start with those. So I think I'll, I'll stick more on the probation side. There's really very little evidence around civil practice and it isn't an area that I've been working in recently um, to be able to sort of make clear recommendations around sort of custodial agreements and supervision arrangements. Um, and I don't actually know if there are I'm not familiar with any papers with data published on that topic. There are probably some practice guidance papers, particularly in the social work field. I'd be happy to help you find some. Um, from a probation perspective around conditions, there's um, not a lot of sort of empirical published evidence supporting what works better. I mean, in our study of youth, we found not surprisingly <laughs> that the average number of conditions attached to probation and supervision orders was sort of like, I don't know if I could follow all of those rules, um, sometimes as high as in the, you know, one or two dozen number of conditions. Um, and so I've heard certain, certainly clinically and, and in terms of practice recommendations without a, a, a ton of sort of hard data backing these recommendations that really simplifying these so that they're actually maintainable um, and followable, if you will, is one recommendation, having fewer conditions and also really focusing on the conditions that need to be met and partnering those with the supports and resources required to be able to meet conditions. So, you know, if you have a condition around housing and supervision and curfew, then you need to have stable housing and you may need reminders around curfew and other kinds of supports. So making sure that rules have appropriate supports and provisions in place to actually make them um, attainable. Um, there's also some cool work coming out of Manitoba um, where they used icons to have sort of a visual pairing um, so that you could have like the, the traditional legalese complicated, you know, legal order, but then also a set of verbal and visual icons to actually help folks have a quick and easy reminder of what their current conditions were. Um, and I've seen lots of excitement about having those additional cues, multimodal cues available to simplify things for folks folks. Um, there are also some really cool programs in the United States and Canada that I didn't get time to talk about today. We have a brand new specialty problem solving um, mental health court, um, an FASD court that where the docket is entirely devoted to seeing folks with FASD um, every so many cases a month in the province of Manitoba. Um, there are some specialty FASD screening court programs in the United States. Um, and there are also some forensic teams that have gone and gotten specialized FASD forensic training um, so that they can incorporate consideration of FASD in their everyday forensic practice. And so that it's not an add-on or something extra, it's just the same as they would consider um, other kinds of differential diagnoses around schizophrenia or depression or um, you know, externalizing disorders. Um, and those are some, I think, promising areas of being able to extend practice and, and have unique um, solutions to the needs of this complex population that don't quite fit in a mental health category and don't quite fit in the intellectual disability category either in terms of our traditional responses. All right, we've got a couple of questions about um, how FASD is used in, in specific forensic cases. So um, the use of an FASD diagnosis <clears throat> in relation to um, an individual understanding their Miranda rights. And then also um, in terms of criminal responsibility. And then sure. I'll so finish us out for today for questions. 
You bet. Um, I'm familiar with the case law around criminal responsibility in Canada. I know that we've had two cases where FASD has played a role in a finding of criminal responsibility, but both of those cases were from a single jurisdiction and both um, really provided limited um, application in terms of, um, oh, what's the word that I'm looking for? precedent, um, limited application of precedent in those cases because the individuals um, had multiple mental health and cognitive needs and FASD in those cases were compared, the symptoms around FASD were compared to sort of meeting the threshold that would be commonly presented in the context of thought disorder um, when someone was experiencing signs of psychosis. And I believe there may have been symptoms of psychosis in one of the cases. So courts in Canada have certainly been reluctant to um, apply NCR provisions or to have FASD alone being seen as meeting um, the legal provisions around criminal responsibility. Um, and uh, I, I expect that jurisprudence to continue to sort of be pushed a little bit as courts become more aware and lawyers become more aware of some of the really pervasive natures of the nature of the deficits associated with the disability. Um, uh, there is more common application of FASD around psycholegal abilities and um, adjudicative competence. So there are several cases where um, in the United States and in Canada, FASD, the, the neurocognitive deficits, particularly in folks with a more pervasive intellectual disability concurrently diagnosed, are seen as um, substantially impairing one's ability to sort of understand um, what's going on and also really impair that appreciation um, arm of the test. Um, in Canada, we have a limited cognitive capacity standard, so the, the bar is pretty conservative around fitness, um, more so than in some jurisdictions, uh, so there are not as many cases there. And I have read a few cases um, in the Canadian context around admissibility and voluntary provision of um, statements in the context of rights waiver. Um, so there are a couple of good case law reviews um, looking at federal cases in the U.S. Um, and um, one case law review in Canada and another in Australia, the, the review in Canada actually found that FASD was the most common form of neuroscientific evidence presented amongst cases where neuroscientific evidence was presented in criminal cases. So um, if you're interested in, in sort of um, receiving those resources to look at the jurisprudence, um, we, we do our best as psychologists in this interdisciplinary way, but there are some great legal case reviews as well that I'd be happy to share with you. All right. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. Um, a lot of really Thank positive you. feedback in the Q&A and text messages and emails about how much everyone's enjoyed the talk. So oh. we really, really appreciate your time. For those of you that are still on, please go ahead and copy that link over or complete it. We'll probably be on for maybe another minute, but otherwise um, we'll see you all next week. And again, thanks for your time. Thanks so much again, Julie and everyone for having me and for uh, hosting this great event and uh, to everyone for attending today. I'm always really happy when we can uh, share more knowledge about the field and please, I really do mean it. Um, feel free to reach out to me and all you working parents out there with kids at home, I see you. Uh, it could take a little bit of time for me to get back to you, but I'll do my very best as, as we are navigating this pandemic and complicated, unique times together. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much, Take Caitlin. Care. Thank you Bye -bye. so much, Kara, for your um, services. Oh, thank Thanks. you, Kara, very much. I <laughs> this was a very cool experience. I I hope I hope I didn't go too quickly for you. Awesome, wonderful. Oh, I really appreciate up. it. Great. Okay, so we've been on for a half hour after the lecture. Everybody should have grabbed the CEU link. So we're going to log off. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. Have a great day.